um, you had to take off and land into wind. The training was very basic, and these guys used to get, if they were lucky, five, five hours training before they actually were sent off on the, in the airplanes to go solo, to go fighting. There were quite a lot of crashes here, people learning to fly, and they used to lay them out in the squash course. Our passion here really now is, is the old biplanes, and we've got these 20s and 30s biplanes, and uh, they're just wonderful bits of kit, and you know, you, you fly one yourself, and there's nothing nicer than flying around on a summer's day in an old biplane, it's just, you feel so privileged and lucky to be able to do that. Vic, I think for me one of the most intriguing aircraft here is this lovely old de Havilland Gypsy Moth, the forerunner of the Tiger Moth. Yes, 1929 aeroplane, um, made for the man in the street to get him aviating. How much of this one is original? It's got this lovely old wooden prop. This is an original propeller. It's been rebuilt. It's got a new leading edge put on there. Um, and most of the aeroplane is original. It's plywood construction, no tubular frame. Uh, the wings have obviously all been recovered in this cotton and sewn onto all of these ribs. Fantastic amount of work in that. Original interplane struts, original landing and flying wires. Very original aeroplane. This is the aircraft that Amy Johnson flew across the world with. You can't believe it, can you? I mean, look at it. Nothing in there. You've got a sort of ship's type compass. So you put your heading on there. It's OK when you're flying over the, over the ground. You know, you can fly low in these things and follow roads and look at the cities and the rivers. But over the sea where you're dead reckoning, I mean, it's an incredibly brave thing to do. You fly it from the back? Yeah. You fly it from the back um, because all your variable load, your fuel as you use it, and your different weight of passengers, you want them as near the centre of lift as possible because that way it doesn't affect the handling of the aircraft. So always fly one of these from the back. Vic only flies the Gypsy about six times a year. What a thrill then that I could satisfy one of my lifelong ambitions. The case of all hands on deck here. Alan's having to do a bit of wing walking. Extremely basic, so it needs some man handling to get us around into the right position. Maneuvering onto the end of the runway, coming round into wind, and here we go. Tail comes up at about 25 miles an hour, and we get lift off at about 50 miles an hour, and we're airborne. Something like this really almost is his plaything. That was probably the most fantastic thing I've ever done. Vic, I can't say thank you enough. What a pleasure and a privilege that was. Well, I'm sorry about the bouncy landing, but we've got about... Well, we got two for the price of one. Well, we? we did, but we've got about 18 <laughs> knots gusting wind here, and this old girl doesn't want to land, so I got it right the second time. The first time wasn't so good.
far if only there were an aircraft that could be kept at home, easily transported to the airfield, rigged for flight in under five minutes and be propelled by petrol, that really would be something. Well, actually, there is. This is the Europa XS. This and other aircraft like it are making flying even more accessible than ever before. The Europa XS can be built and stored in your garage and towed on its own lightweight trailer. It runs on aviation fuel or conventional unleaded, so you can fill it up at your local petrol station on the way to the airfield, which is handy for anyone still collecting those few extra points for that last cut crystal glass. The Rotax 914 turbo engine gets a cool 750 miles from one tank of petrol. Try getting that out of your average motor. You can assemble it in under five minutes. All you need is an extra pair of hands and a couple of pins. Then just 200 yards of takeoff strip and you'll be cruising a maximum of 200 miles an hour. The aircraft starts life as a parts made in a factory in deepest Yorkshire. If you want one, you've got two options. Buy the bits and find someone qualified to build the plane for you, or do it yourself. Well, Andy, anyone can buy one of these kits, but how do you know that when they get it home, it's going to be made safely? Well, there's an organisation called the Popular Flying Association who um, have a whole series of inspectors spread around the countryside who come and inspect every stage of the project. So how long does it take for somebody to build one of these from start to finish? Well, if you're working full-time, it um, should take someone about five months to build, about 750 hours. While at the factory, I began having a go at assembling the kit. There are ten major mouldings, all made of composite materials, like the fuselage, wings and cockpit. But overall, there are two and a half thousand parts you count all the nuts, bolts and washers. Surprisingly, it was quite straightforward, but sadly, I only had an afternoon. We suggest to people to take every step one at a time. There's no point looking at the whole picture and uh, thinking, I'm never going to do all this, because <laughs> it's, it's a big project. All of a sudden, you end up with an aeroplane. With 300 aircraft under construction in the UK alone, the Europa XS is a British success story. Designed, built and tested to the latest requirements, it always was an ambitious project. The aircraft incorporates a whole range of interesting features. The aircraft is designed from the outset to form a range of tasks. Uh, good cross-country touring, good short field, field performing, good fuel economy, good weight capability. Just a good all-round two-seat touring aeroplane. The Europa uses a joystick instead of a yoke, and I couldn't wait to get my hands on it. Going up. Oh, it climbs very quickly. Oh, I'm impressed with its maneuverability. It certainly is. You can just throw it around, and it's very responsive. It seems like a small plane, but once you're inside, it's actually, it feels very roomy. I think it's because it's so light. It's got this glass canopy. Well, he docks you the way I'm going. <laughs> Keep going up. Try to come down a bit. For someone who fancies a weekend away, the Europa is capable of flying two people and 80 pounds of luggage to the south of France. I was impressed by how solid it felt for a kit plane, and at a starting price of 35,000 pounds, the Europa should make flying far more accessible. So now there's an aircraft that I can keep at home, run on ordinary petrol and have me in Monte Carlo in time for a long martini on the beach, stirred, not shaken. Nah, must be dreaming. It's clearly against the ethos of Renkum to allow modern flying machines in here. So this must be someone very important. One of the great joys of aviation, of course, is that you meet people of all types, from sportsmen to rock stars. And one of the co-owners here at Renkham, an important face on the field, is Pink Floyd drummer Nick Mason and his wife Annette. How did you get involved in the airfield here? There's one man responsible for this, and his name is Vic Norman. <laughs> um, and it was interesting, really, because I was talking to Vic one day, and 
I mentioned that I was frightened of flying. And Which well, you had to do a lot, presumably, with a bat. An awful lot. Yeah. Thousands of, of miles of misery of holding the plane up with my hands. And uh, he said, ah, oh, well, of course, the thing you need to do is learn to fly yourself. And I have to say, he was absolutely right, because uh, it transformed the whole business of flying, and, and it turned it into something that I've enjoyed ever since. And this is your own Piper? It is, in fact, a replica, a, a replica aircraft. And the curious thing is that were it a car, one would rather frown at this. But in fact, with an aircraft, it's a really rather nice idea. And the feeling that these are all new parts is enormously comforting. You, you fly this and your fixed wings for fun, but you then got involved in rotary as well. Yes, I think that was, uh, for once, it wasn't Vic Norman. Uh, this was, I think, Nettie, really, who decided that this was definitely a more useful, uh, probably a more useful way of travelling for us. And I like to be able to go somewhere and take people and um, has a purpose in a, in a way. Yeah. And, and also you can land in smaller places. <laughs> and you bought a Jet Ranger, which is one of the best for the job. Yes, well, we think, I mean, we have children and with children you get luggage and so we probably should have got a Chinook with a cargo <laughs> lift underneath it but this is the nearest thing to it. But you've taken it seriously and got an instructor's rating? Yes I did and I thought that might give me more authority in the cockpit sadly not the case. <laughs> <laughs> um, no I, I, it, was a, it was a particularly good exercise and I think I'd recommend it for anyone who wanted to develop their license from a PPL because it, uh, it's probably the most intensive way of improving your flying um, in, in a minimum number of hours because, in fact, it covers exactly what you learn as a PPL, but you have to try and do it properly and be able to explain it to, to someone else. Well, I must say, it's great fun to be back in a helicopter again. Did you find it easy initially to, to learn to fly a helicopter? Um, I th not particularly. I think it's quite tricky for everyone, particularly particularly hovering. There's always that sort of moment where you just think, I can't do this. And then <laughs> it does just sort of gradually come good. I, I mean, presumably, as a, as a rock drummer, you are uh, a sensitive, creative creature. <laughs> um, Hopefully, maybe not that, but certainly, uh, hopefully, coordinated. So there is some correlation there. Um, possibly. I, I think actually, um, most people, if taught properly, can fly helicopters. I don't think it's easier or more difficult for drummers. I'd have to say. <laughs> day job is running a wing walking display team and somehow he taught me into trying one of his stunts. So you think you want to work for the BBC do you? Oh! Vic made sure he gave me the ride of my life and even on the ground he had a last trick up his sleeve. What can I say? It's outrageous. <laughs> Wing walking began after the First World War when D-mob pilots turned to putting on shows to make a living. One word not in their vocabulary was safety. Perhaps the most surprising aircraft to be found at Renkham is the original wing walking machine, a beautifully restored Curtis Jenny. What's so lovely about this aeroplane the McWhorter brothers, Ray McWhorter, he went out to the Western Front in the First War and he never saw any action because the war, the fighting had finished. 
but he'd learnt to fly on one of these jennies. He came back to America, in Iowa, where he lived, and he bought this aeroplane, a surplus jenny, in 1919, and he barnstormed it in 1919, 20 and 21, and earned his living flying this aeroplane. Wing walking, Alan, started because when they started going to these little towns and settlements, after you'd been there one or two times, it didn't cause quite so much interest. So they had the brilliant idea of getting their girlfriends or mechanics to climb out onto the wing of the aircraft and they'd say, right, we'll fly down the high streets. We'll really get these guys buzzing. And they'd go right down the high street with someone standing on the wing, out in the wing. Suddenly, everyone would run out to the field. You had your audience there. You'd get your five bucks off them. You could take them flying. I needed to be balanced on my flight, and who better to do it than Sarah Moisani. So how did you get started then doing this? I'm actually a pilot, so I sort of knew about this in aviation. And I did my ATPL, had enough of that, and I just needed a break, and this seemed like a fun thing to do. Sarah, I've noticed there's an awful lot of waving seems to go on up there. What's all that about? The waving is because, um, of course, at air shows, um, we're at quite a distance away from the, pub from the crowd. And um, if we don't wave, then the public might think that we're dummies. So lots of waves. Vic's always searching for new ideas for his show and his later stunt really returns to the bravado of the 1920s. This remarkable feat is enacted by the one and only Helen Tempest. RAF Bryce Norton, my first posting in the RAF 30 years ago. But today we've come back to have a look at their tankers to see how they keep the rest of the aircraft in the air. I wonder if they'll let me back in. Bryce Norton operates two types of tanker, the VC-10 and the TriStar. And with Britain's armed forces needing the ability to operate in any corner of the world, in-flight refuelling is ever more important. Imagine travelling at 400 miles an hour, trying to throw a dart into a moving bullseye. Well, that's what the fighter pilots, who will be manoeuvring their probes into this basket on the end of the refuelling line, will be doing. I'd been invited on a typical exercise, and as I was to see, the skills required for the process are quite remarkable. V1. Rotate. I thought for one glorious moment that I was going to be doing the first class flying feature, but no, as usual, the Cadenet's got that. This is where the real men hang out, though. We're on an RAF VC-10. It's a very versatile aircraft, although it's an old one. It can be kitted out in the passenger role, takes 127 passengers, or in the cargo role, eight pallets can get into the full empty aircraft, or in the aeromed role, with three stretchers on each of these stretcher posts, a total of 78 if it was all stretchers or it can be a combination of all three, plus the in-flight refuelling roll. And that's what today's flight is all about. And I was really looking forward to seeing what promised to be some fantastic flying. The plan today is that we're going to set up what's called a tanker tow line at 20,000 feet over the North Sea, and we'll be joined by a selection of Harriers, Jaguars and Tornadoes in formation coming in to refuel.
From a distance, a gaggle of small fighters following the large tanker looks like chicks following a mother bird. So the receiver aircraft are known as chicks. This is some of the smoothest and most accurate flying you'll ever see. Flight Lieutenant Mark Oliver, known as Ollie to his mates, is one of 10 squadrons refueling instructors, air-to-air -air flight refueling. Ollie, as far as you're concerned, you're looking just to fly absolutely straight and level at a constant speed and let them join up behind you. That, that's the technique, yeah, to do as little moving around as possible. And also we have to balance that. We're trying to stay in contact with the front aircraft. As the fuel is passed over, the centre of gravity of both the tanker and receiver changes, so the two pilots must compensate while maintaining contact in sometimes turbulent conditions. With the other VC-10 having refuelled a gaggle of GR4 tornadoes, it was our turn to tank some F3s. The receivers wait off the tanker's wing while it pays out or streams its refuelling hoses. The VC-10 has one on each wing and one under the fuselage. Moving forward. Basically now I'm just giving a brief on where the chap's actually going to, making sure that he's moving around the rear of the aircraft in a safe manner. What I'm going to do now is talk the chap in and control how much fuel I give him from the, the panel here. Closing up. Approaching the basket. Contact. Pushing in. Green on. Fuel flows. Steady. But the, the important part of your job here, or one of the important parts, is to, to make sure that you ha keep your centre of gravity within limits on the, on the tanker. That's right, yeah. We're actually giving away fuel from our main wing tanks. So I can actually control where I give the fuel from to control where the CFG actually is on the airframe at any time. OK, so far, but now for perhaps the most surprising bit. If the tanker gets low, it too can take on fuel from another tanker using its centre hose. And there goes the centre one. So one thing that we're looking at before we do some tanking ourselves is to make sure that the hose that is coming out now is a stable one and it's not flapping around the sky. That looks OK to me at the moment. All right, now we're going to move astern. I'm going to look outside, just fly his aircraft across the top of the windscreen and I'm controlling the rate at which I do that. You can see underneath that you've got a lot of black and white bands. That's, that's what's going to help me do the refueling in a minute, and they're my air-to-air -air refueling references. You can see that I'm trying to get the lateral references into one big smile. When it forms one solid band, we're at the correct height. You can see we're not quite there yet. Fantastic. There we are. One band across the underneath of the fuselage. I'm going to use the references on the underside of the aeroplane. In fact, if I do look at the basket, I'll end up flying all over the shop. So there is a special technique required to refuel behind a, a tanker, so you have to be taught that. Uh, it's just basically don't chase the basket that you're looking at and uh, fly the techniques that you've been shown. See the aircraft starting to get a lot bigger now. We're getting very close. OK, moving forward, power on. contact, pushing in, that's the, the hard part over, it's just the getting in, uh, maintaining your position, and then after that, it's fairly fairly simple really. And the great thing here, Ollie, is we might be in a, an airliner cockpit, but this is not airliner flying, is it? It's real hands-on stuff. This is the exciting thing about it, I think, you know, to be honest, that, uh, you get right in there with the action as you're doing the same thing as what the, uh, the fast jet guys are doing when it comes to air to air refueling, you have a go at that yourself, uh, it's just thrilling. Drop it back. There's the other light. Come on. After refueling ourselves, we have plenty more customers. That's all the hard work done. Now for that renowned first-class service. 
Thank you very much, Will. The hostesses aren't quite so lovely in the area. <laughs> Well, what a day we've had, Julian. What was your favourite bet? Absolutely no doubt about it. Flying in that gypsy moth, a boyhood dream come true. So it's goodbye from us at Renkham, and I have to tell you, I really envy him, his flight in the gypsy moth. Bye. The boys are going to go and play with their toys now. <laughs> Why are they laughing? <laughs> Just because I'm old and stiff. There's some special messages for you, you, and you on there. <laughs> Next week, we're bang up to date again as I fly to France. Julian's on board an AWACS, Robert Elms finds out how to start your own airline, and Vicky Kim checks out the Flying Doctor's latest aircraft. Across the world.